but I try to stay on top of it by proper diet, never failing to get up every single morning and doing all of your your exercises that I can now do only by being seated or remaining in bed. And uh, at night, I do your breathing so that I sleep well. And I really think that without all those things, I'd be in the same shape that I see a lot of other people, young, even younger than me. So today on Her Story, we are going to hear from Joy about her experiences as an orthopedic nurse and as a woman who is determined to age as healthy and strong as possible. Welcome, Joy. Thank you, Debbie. Okay, Joy, I, I, well, I asked you on here for various reasons because you and I have known each other for a lot of years, maybe eight years at this point, maybe since 2015, and you've been a very important part of my life as you know, because you introduced me to the doctor that you worked for that did my hip replacement. So I'm forever grateful for getting my life back and especially by such an amazing person. Um, I am so pleased by the approach you take to life and to doing all that you can to be as strong as healthy as you age. So I'd like for you to share a little bit about your background what you what you did for a living, what you saw, and, and what's the driving force behind why you do what you do and what you do. <laughs> we want to hear okay. that. Too. I'll try to do my best to explain to you what I think contributed to my well-being. I was thinking about this in advance of our podcast today, and it occurred to me that I would like to think of my parents as having been a very strong influence in my life. They were kind, ethical, caring people who really instilled a sense of uh, goodness in their children. And I've hopefully been able to carry on those aspects of life into the lives of my own family. I'm a mother of three sons, uh, married very young during the Korean War, interrupted my education uh, when my husband was uh, activated in the service. And after just two years of college, uh, we married as many did in those days. And uh, before I knew it, I had my three babies and they were wonderful, wonderful children. One had a severe learning disability, which I think of as one of the reasons that I ended up in the career that I did. Uh, fast forward, my husband was an architect and his career took him to many different places in this country. He had a very rewarding, successful career and we moved umpteen different times. Uh, this week, we celebrated our 71st anniversary. However, it hasn't been without a lot of trials and tribulations and health issues and what have you. We now have seven grandchildren, all, almost all but one grown, and uh, we're expecting our second great-grandchild uh, this next week. So how did I get to where I am? Yeah, uh, career-wise, uh, your career. <laughs> How did you get to where you are career-wise? Career-wise, uh, my middle son, who was dyslexic and had a lot of medical issues, sort of forced me into realizing there was a, a medical world out there. However, even prior to that, uh, when I was in high school and in college, I volunteered in various local Los Angeles hospitals. I went to work when my youngest son was three, and I worked steadily until I was almost 80 in the field of medicine in one aspect of it or another. Times were different in the start of my career, if you will call it that. I had various and sundry interesting jobs uh, in medicine, the first of which was in working as a receptionist in an emergency room that was followed by having answered an ad uh, when we moved one of the many times that we were forced to move 
Uh, and it called for someone who had experience with birth defective children. And to me, that meant something akin to what my child was experiencing. And it turned out that that physician who hired me to be his receptionist and it became office manager, et cetera, he was the head of uh, UCLA's plastic surgery program. And this takes us into the 1960s. And I didn't know that he uh, was a specialist in physical disabilities, not educational or learning disabilities. And um, from there, I moved on to a very, very uh, prominent edifice in Los Angeles that's about, I don't know, 10, 15 stories high, and it housed nothing but medical practices. And in those times, in the 70s, uh, there were no, no such things as Medicare qualifications or anything of that nature. And uh, I was hired by a, a physician who trained me to be an operating room uh, assistant. And I went right into the operating room with him, operated on countless people with him. I could never, ever count how many. And uh, that, in turn, led me into the world of orthopedics. I, When I was through with my surgical assisting, which I did for about 10 years, very gratifying, really wonderful, wonderful time in my life. Boys were all educated. They were getting out of college, etc. And uh, I was free to continue on this path. And uh, I started a medical management bill business in that building. It had about 100 physicians. And uh, I had many built-in clients, people I knew. I did their hiring, their firing of their staff. I trained their staff. I had a billing staff. I did seminars all over the country, et cetera. And I was contacted by a local residency program, which is where I met the doctor who operated on your hip some 30 years ago. And they became my clients. And at one point in time, after I too had had the experience of a lifetime, I will say, a successful management business, clients all over the country, they said, why don't you come and work for us? And I gave it a lot of thought. This is the practice that he was associated with and the residency program that he was associated with. And it was strictly joint replacement, major joint replacement and orthopedic trauma. So I started out with them in the nursing aspect of their practice, but it eventually evolved into one of the administrators. We, again, using 100 people as an explanation that's how many people that practice employed. And he became the principal of that practice, which is why when you had problems, I knew I was recommending somebody very, very, very capable and special to you. So I worked in orthopedics with everyone from John Doe in this world to major, major athletes in Hollywood personalities and what have you. And it has just been a marvelously rewarding career. Yeah, that's why that. you stayed. That's why you stayed. I remember you telling me you were going to retire, but he got you. I was. So were you, were you a yeah, well, nurse or a nurse or an assistant? I mean, no, I, I had a two year uh, educational experience at UCLA and then and that was there was no nursing pro program oh. at that time. It was in the early 1950s. Okay. I graduated from high school uh, before I was 17, so I was in that program till I was 19, and then got married and never went further back into it because I immediately started working in medicine. So in those days, you needed no certification whatsoever. Okay. But I would say that initially, my title would have been surgical tech. There was such a thing in those days, and you needed no certification. So 
I never was a bedside nurse as such, uh, right. but I was always in the surgical aspects of orthopedics from then on. And um, fortunately for a lot of human beings in the world today, the doctor we speak of is one of the principals in a magnificent humanitarian program, which is called Operation Walk. And they have done thousands and thousands and thousands of joints the world over. And I, too, was one of the privileged people to coordinate a great deal of that program. We've gone all over the map. He, currently, he's in the Philippines, and next week he'll be in Tanzania. And they do 50 major joints, meaning hips or knees, uh, when on every mission, and they do two missions a year. Yeah, it's so, so amazing because joint health is critical to being happy, being healthy in your body. Okay, so uh, we've spoke a little bit. I asked you, what did you observe when somebody, w when you were in an operating room? Like I asked you, could you tell lifestyle factors? Was it apparent to you the lifestyle someone had and how relational did you feel that somebody their lifestyle was to where they ended up needing a replacement or whatever it was like what did you notice or what did you see i wanted to know how the role of lifestyle and healthy living and degeneration in the body so you told me some things you observed okay well i have to go backwards a little bit because prior to being in the operating room um, with a particular patient I was responsible at all times for many, many years of doing the initial workup and the initial history. I would take the initial call from the patient because in the beginning, we were a two-man team before we became who we ended up being. And I would take the call from the patient or the patient's referring doctor, then bring them into the office, interview them, find out about their lifestyle and about what what brought them to the office at that point. So I knew a great deal about the patient before they ever got to the operating room. And yes, in answer to your question, their lifestyle and their God-given uh, ability to deal with that lifestyle whether they had hereditary aspects of their uh, physical being, whether they were suffering emotional issues, they all fed into whether we chose them as a, can a qualified candidate for surgery. And it was borne out on numerous occasions, far too many for me to ever tell you about. We knew in advance who had a deteriorated health system, body, et cetera, because they didn't live right. They didn't have the, the opportunity to be healthy in the beginning. And we rejected many, many people because they were either heavy smokers, obese people, um, people who we didn't feel were sound enough to accept the challenges of major surgery. And this was all borne out the moment the knife went in. And I remember telling you at one point that a smoker was obvious immediately because the tissues in their body had a different consistency than the person who had better health habits. And the outcomes, therefore, were far more predictable in a healthy person. And we recommended to many, many patients that prior to going into surgery, that they elevate their standard of existence in terms of their diet, in terms of their exercise, uh, resolving any issues that were making them unhappy. Or you have to be a whole human being to have a successful surgery. Yeah, I hope I answered some of that. No, you did. And then do you think that that's informed you? Because I, you're going to be, can we say your age? You certainly may. You will be 90 yes. in September. And so, Correct. and you just, you're so healthy. And all the, every time you go to a doctor, you've had a couple of mishaps over the years, some falls and some things. They're just yes. so in awe of you. So I, I'm, I'm sure on some level that's been informed you, seeing all that pain and suffering that you saw, because joints, knees, and hips 
such a painful existence. Um, and then, you know, for me, I do osteoporotic work. So hip fractures, the hip is hip is such an important area. Um, and so is that been part of what your driving force is? And tell me what it is you do, like what's your mindset around staying healthy? Well, living a wholesome lifestyle, as wholesome as it can be at our age, um, I still drive. At, at the moment, I'm told not to because I'm anticipating a second hip replacement. And the doctor is fearful that my leg will fail me at times. Uh, but I eat in a very conscious way. I've been fortunate enough to have warded off diabetes in its full form for since I was 35 years old. I was uh, told I was pre-diabetic, so my carb intake is limited and my exercise is very important to me. And I still test every other day and I keep it at bay. So I'm very happy with how I've handled my physical well-being. Emotionally, there are times when you can't avoid upheavals and things of that nature. And my husband hasn't been well on many occasions throughout our 71 years. But I've talked to myself and told myself that what's important is to stay strong physically and uh, as emotionally sound a life as you can live okay so what, uh, what is your I, ticket for what is your what are your what is your tools or what is your trick for staying strong health uh physically if i have told you many many times you're one of my g's and uh i do everything you've taught me in the eight or nine years we've known one another prior to knowing you i did take many a class in yoga and i probably done yoga since i was about 30 years old, and it was never uh, something I went to. I did it on a Saturday when I had time and then did it at home. But I've always kept my body mobile. It, it failed me at times when I had to have major back surgery three times, and I've had a hip replacement. I've had countless other, as I, I hereditarily, I wasn't blessed with such great uh, medical situations. My father was diabetic and uh, also had a heart disease. I've had a lot of heart issues, but I try to stay on top of it by proper diet, never failing to get up every single morning and doing all of your, your exercises that I can now do only by being seated or remaining in bed. And uh, at night, I do your breathing so that I sleep well. And I really think that without all those things, I'd be in the same shape that I see a lot of other people, young, even younger than me. Yeah. What about, so you do, you do yoga every day? You do physical something every day for your body? I wake up every morning and I do <laughs> your hand situations, all everything you've taught with regard to wrists, fingers, shoulder girdle. I don't get out of bed until my body is mobile. Somewhere way down the line, years ago, a physical therapist told me that with my spinal issues, uh, I should never awaken and start my day without uh using a heating pad for at least a half an hour so that the muscles in my spine would be relaxed. After I do your exercises and I do leg raises, I do zig wig wags, I do uh, opening up the chest cavities, that takes me about a good 15, 20 minutes in the morning. After I, prior to doing that, I do lay on the heating pad. And by the time I get up to brush my teeth, I feel very free in my body, which I don't think I would if I didn't do all of the things that you've taught me to do. Yeah, that's amazing. That's joint range of motion, fluidity in your body. And I think that's one of the things I observed the most and noticed myself when I had my hip issues is if, if we don't use it, we lose it. And 
when we don't have that mobility, when we don't have that joint range, range of motion, when everything is tight, it's very hard to move. And then it actually, things degenerate even more if you don't move. You know, you have less, if you don't move, you're able to move less. And when you're able to move less, you're not moving as much and you have more degeneration. So it's like this whole downhill spiral. I, yeah, I didn't think it's amazing that you, that that's a part of your daily routine. And, and I think that that's what I'd love for people to understand is that we have to take care of ourselves. There's no one else coming in to do it for us. It's not here, take this pill. Here is this supplement or here is this thing. It isn't, it's a self-care practice. And that's, you know, yoga to me is a self-care practice. So yeah, well, I'm just amazed at you, Joy, and Thank the state you. of your health. And then every time you have an ailment, you fall or you, you know, something <laughs> has always happened. It's happened too many times of late. Uh, and I can't tell you whether it was that I wasn't observant of my surroundings or whether my limbs just weren't coordinated well enough. But senior citizens do fall. That's that's the fact. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah we're not going to stop that. You know what I would say? That you are bendable and not breakable. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I hope that that stays the way it, it, it is, uh, that I can continue to stay at that level for a long, long time. I, it, I'm blessed. I'm a great basketball fan, professional basketball, and we have operated on so many athletes, I couldn't ever enumerate them for you. But they use an expression often that they're blessed. I've been told a hundred billion times that these guys were blessed to have met us. And I have to say that I am blessed to have been able to incorporate everything I've learned about healthy living into my own lifestyle. Uh, it, it's it's really made it a wonderful life. That's what I can tell you. All right, well, thank you for sharing your story. I hope that other women are inspired to realize that every day, just even 15 minutes of keeping yourself lubricated and mobile is gonna take you a long way to that 90. I always say, think of the number 100. We're gonna live to 100. And how many more years do you have to live and what do you want them to look like? That's and right. you're, you're proof in the pudding that you're living a very full, active lifestyle. I should have added, a, and I, forgive me for overlooking this, that in addition to what you've taught me, I walk every single day. And I now live in an apartment complex. It has a gym, it has a pool, it has many, many things that I could take advantage of. And I don't, but I walk. I walk the halls, I walk, it's a large building, and I walk three times around most every single day. And uh, I, I just, I never give that activity up because I think if I miss a day, I can feel the difference in my body. Well, that's great. So keep doing it. Keep doing what you're Thank doing you. because it's working. It, I, I have to, I have to keep up with my, all my kids and grandchildren and what have you you know and that's a motivating factor for a lot of women and it's like either you don't want to be seen as the weakling you don't want your family to to be dependent on your family or you want to keep up with the younger generation and all of your grandkids and now great grandkids so great job thank you so much for sharing your story with us thank you debbie bye-bye thank you so much for listening to stronger bones lifestyle podcast Bone loss is not an inevitable part of aging. We don't have to just wait for it to happen. There is so much that you can do. And that is what you will learn each week on the show. Go to my website, DebbieRobinson.com. If you want more information about what was shared in today's episode, at the bottom of this episode in the show notes, there will be links to whatever was shared. Please subscribe to this podcast. Share this podcast with your friends, your family, or any women that you think may be interested or benefit from the information we're sharing. Please rate the podcast. And if you have any questions you'd like asked or answered, I would love to hear from you. Let's do this, ladies. Let's change the way the world views osteoporosis and slow down, stop, or reverse our bone loss, take charge, and show other ladies what is possible. Thank you so much for joining me.